following sermon is rated PG due to mature subject matter. Welcome to week four of a series we've been in called Suicidal. And what we've been saying in this series is that suicide affects us all, doesn't it? It's in the news. It's in our schools, in our families, among our friends. It's hard to find somebody that hasn't been affected by suicide. We said this is the common road that leads some people to that place. We've been talking about this in this series. Difficult circumstances come and can lead to sadness. And overwhelming sadness can lead to depression. Depression can lead to suicidal thoughts. And some people, after having these thoughts, choose to act on these thoughts. Tragically, they're not with us here today. A statistic I've been showing you over the last couple weeks is this that kind of helps us understand how important this is. Every year in the United States, more than 36,000 individuals die by suicide. Hundreds of thousands attempt suicide. And millions of friends and loved ones are affected. And many of us are in the, the millions that are affected. So here's our hope, back to the road in this series. Here, here's our hope, is that if people, as they journey down this road, end up at this place where they're having suicidal thoughts, our hope and prayer is that they would not act on these thoughts, that they would realize that there's help and that there's hope and that lives would literally be saved as a result of this series. That's our hope and prayer. It's been that since the beginning. So let me show you where we've been. First week we talked about uh, just removing the stigma of mental illness in the church. We said that was a very important. Let's go back to the road again. Second week, we talked about difficult circumstances. Uh, third week, last week, we talked about sadness. What do you do when sadness comes? And today I want to talk some about depression. If you get a clinical diagnosis of depression from a doctor, what do you do? Let's talk some about depression today. Here's some introductory uh, thoughts. First, in this series, when I use the word depression, I'm talking about a clinical diagnosis from a doctor. That's why I'm frequently using the phrase clinical depression like doctor-diagnosed depression as opposed to self-diagnosed depression. When we're sad, we often say, I'm depressed. But what we really mean is just that we're going through a difficult circumstance and we are feeling sad. And this is why sometimes it's difficult for us to understand people that say they're depressed and they really are depressed because we're like, oh yeah, I was that the other day, but then the next day I was fine. What we meant is we were sad, but they're struggling with depression. They're different. <laughs> One of the major differences between sadness and depression is the degree to which you can function. With sadness, you can often continue normal day-to-day -day activities, but with depression, your ability to function is impaired. Depression is considered a mental illness by the medical community. So in this series, we're gonna talk about it like it's an illness. Depression should be taken very seriously just like any other illness. Remember, remember the statistic. Remember more than 90% of people who die by suicide struggle with depression or some kind of mental illness. We must take it very seriously. If you think that you might be depressed, if you realize that your ability to function is impaired, I would strongly urge you to see a doctor immediately. In this message, I wanna talk specifically to people that have seen a doctor and have been diagnosed with some type of depression, I believe that God can bring you help and God can bring you hope in your battle with this illness. And I want to talk about that today. If you got a Bible, let's go. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to look in the Bible because we want to know what God says, don't we? We be believe that the Bible is the Word of God, that God the Holy Spirit inspired ordinary men to write so that the very words they wrote were the very words of God. 
So as we read this today, we know that we're reading the words of God. We believe the Bible is the authoritative word of God. So 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, this is Paul writing to a church in a town called Corinth. And he had been through a dark time in his life. He had been through a pretty difficult uh, set of circumstances. And he talks to the Corinthians for a few minutes, writes to them about how God brought him help and how God brought him hope. So as we go down through this passage, I just want to stop kind of after each little section and I want to apply it to your depression. To those of you that are depressed, currently clinically depressed, I want to apply these verses to your depression. Can we do that? 2 Corinthians 1. If you're reading along with me, you can use your Bible or you can look up here on the screen. I'll have the verses here. Beginning in verse 3, Paul says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. These aren't just words for Paul. Paul experienced God being a merciful Father to him when he was going through a difficult time, when he was in a dark season. He experienced God as the source of all comfort. And he's saying, hey, Corinthians, one thing I want you to know, God has been a merciful Father to me, as if he's saying he's going to be a merciful Father to you as well. So those of you that are depressed right now, you need to expect God to be a merciful Father to you right now as one of his sick children. What does a a father do when their child is sick, a good dad? Well, I'm no perfect dad, but I love my girls. I'll tell you what I do. If one of my girls is sick, I'll lay down with them. I'll rub their back. I'll pray with them. I'll get them whatever they need, get them medicine. I'll tell them it's going to be okay. I'll tell them dad's going to take care of them. I'll be there to comfort them. I'll be there to answer their questions. I'll, I'll be there for my little girls because I love them, and I want them to know their daddy's going to take care of them. It's as if Paul's saying, hey, in your depression, you need to know God's going to be a father to you like that. He's going to be there to comfort you like you would be there to comfort your kids. So expect him to be a father to you in this time. Look to him to be a father to you in this time, to sit with you and say, hey, it's going to be all right. Daddy's got this. It's going to be all right. He's a merciful father, Paul says, and he's the source of all comfort, meaning (laughs) nothing can bring comfort to you in your depression like he can. We can look to other things to bring us comfort. Nothing can bring comfort like our merciful Father can. He's the source of all comfort. He keeps going. (laughs) He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're trouble, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given to us. So you see what he's saying? His comfort for you in your depression is so certain, you can know that once it's given to you, you're going to be able to give it to others too. He's going to comfort you so well in your depression that you're going to be able to comfort other people that are going through depression. And notice how he's saying sometimes he delivers his comfort. How does he sometimes deliver his comfort? Through other people. Through other people. He comforts us, then we can comfort others. So in your depression, you know, I know one of your tendencies, because I've known people that have have been depressed, is to shut out people. You want to be alone. You don't want to be with people. But what we don't realize that we're doing sometimes is we're rejecting God's comfort because he sent comfort to us in the form of a family member or family members and friends. And we're saying, no, I want to be alone. I want to be alone. And so you've got to resist that temptation to want to be alone because God's wanting to comfort you. But one of the ways he does it is through other people. And so you need to let him in even if it's difficult. Now, this is a good word to family and friends, though, also of uh, um, people that are depressed. God may want to use you to comfort your loved one that's depressed, to comfort your friend that's depressed. So make yourself available for God to use you to comfort them and not to judge them. That's what a lot of times they're used to. But God wants to use you to bring comfort, not judgment. And here's what you have to understand, family and friend. Here's what you have to understand. Unless you've been through it, unless you've been doctor diagnosed with depression, chances are you have no idea about the suffering they're going through. You may think you do because you're like, yeah, I was depressed the other day, and by that you meant you were sad, so you think they have the same thing you had, and they can just snap out of it. They don't have the same thing you had. They're not just sad, they're depressed. So you just need to just get in your mind, hey, I, they're suffering probably far more than I know or could imagine, so I just need to be there to comfort them because I don't have a clue about what they're going through. I haven't been through that. I haven't had my functionality impaired like they have. So I'm just going to be there to comfort them, not judge them. 
your comfort from God is going to be so certain. You'll be able to extend it to others as well, and others are going to extend it to you. So those of you that are depressed, don't shut them. Don't shut them out. Don't turn them away. Let God bring comfort to you through them. He keeps going. Down a couple verses in verse 8, he says this. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble, Paul said, the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. So he was going through something difficult. We don't exactly know what it was. Was he sick? He could have been sick. Was there an accident? There could have been an accident. Was it psychological distress? Could have been. Was it persecution? Maybe so. We don't know. We just know he had some difficult circumstance that caused a tremendous degree of suffering and even some darkness in his life. Look at what he says. He went through trouble. Look at what he says. He described it this way. He said, as a result of these, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. We thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. I don't know if he was depressed or not, but these are depressive symptoms, right? Think about it. Those of you that are currently depressed or have been clinically depressed before, do you feel crushed? Paul identifies with your suffering. Do you feel so overwhelmed you didn't think you'd be able to endure through it? Paul, Paul's been there. Whatever trouble he was going through, he felt so overwhelmed he didn't think he could make it through. He thought he would never live through it. You've been there. He just didn't think you'd, you'd live. He didn't think you'd live through it. He said, in fact, we expected to die. Maybe you've been there. I, don't, I think I'm going to die. I think I'm going to die. I'm not going to make it through it. Paul's saying he, he's been there. He identifies with you in that. Another translation says, they despaired of life itself. That's a bad day. He's like, I don't even know. I mean, he despaired of life. So he gets it. He, there, he's been through a dark hour. I don't know exactly what it was about, but he's got some symptoms here. And look at what he says next. If you're taking notes, this is huge. As a result of all this, we stopped relying on ourselves. We stopped relying on our own strength. I didn't have any more. We stopped relying on ourselves to be able to fix it. I couldn't fix it. Stopped relying on ourselves for a solution. I had no solution. We stopped, we, we stopped relying on ourselves. Relying on myself was crushing me, he's saying. Relying on myself was overwhelming me. I had to stop relying on myself. But I wasn't going to give up. That doesn't mean I'm going to give up. Watch this. As a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. Watch, next. And we learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Paul's going, okay, I got to stop relying on me. But here's the thing. If my God can raise the dead, he can take care of me. I got to stop relying on me and start relying on him. I don't need to give up. I need to give it to God. I need to say, God, this depression, I can't. I can't fix it. I'm trying so hard. I can't. I have no strength anymore, God. I have no hope. Paul's saying, been there. I had to give it to God. I mean, I, could, I couldn't deal with it. I, I, I wasn't going to give up. So many people choose in their depression to give up. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to give it to God. And I'm saying, God, I'm relying on you for strength because I don't have any anymore. God, I'm relying on you to help me because I can't help myself. God, I'm relying on you for hope because I don't have any hope. God, I'm no longer going to rely on me. I'm just going to rely on on you. In your depression, church, you've got to get there. I can't, and and you, a lot of you are. I can't do that. I can't do it. That's okay. It's okay that you can't. Stop relying on yourself. God, I give this to you. I got nothing left. God, I give this to you. Watch what happened when he made the change. And he did rescue us from mortal danger. And he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. What's the obvious theme here? Rescue. <laughs> He's coming to your rescue. If you stop relying on yourself and only rely on him, he will rescue you. That doesn't mean he always takes it away. Sometimes he does. That's why we pray for healing. If you got cancer or any disease or depression or whatever, it's good to pray for healing. God, I pray you heal that person. Sometimes he does that. He can do that, absolutely. He can heal people. Sometimes he does that. But sometimes, instead of healing us then, 
He gives us his strength. We have no strength. He gives us his strength to endure through the suffering, to endure through the depression, to endure through the cancer, to endure through the disease. He doesn't take it away right then. Now we know ultimate healing is going to come, right? For whatever we have. Ultimate rescue is coming. We're going to be with Jesus one day. No more pain, sickness, suffering, death, cancer, depression. It's all gone. In the meantime, sometimes he just heals you. Other times, he gives you the strength, his strength to endure. But always, he'll rescue you. That's what Paul's saying. If I stop relying on me, got to rely only on you. You're going to rescue me. And he said, you did it. You did it. And you're going to keep doing it. God, you are so good to me. This is where you got to get, I hope, by the time we leave here today. You just leave saying this in your depression. I'm going to stop relying on myself and I'm going to rely only on God. You may already be doing this. If you're doing this, great. But some of us aren't. I'm going to stop. Here's what I got to do. I'm going to stop relying on myself. I got nothing left. And I'm just going to rely on you, God. And my confidence is in you that you're going to come to my rescue somehow. That's all I got, God. I give this to you. He will honor that faith. He will honor that request. And he will come to your rescue in some way. You watch. You watch. I'm going to stop relying on me. I'm going to only rely on you, God. I'm going to stop relying on me, only on you. I'm not giving up, even though I have no more strength. I'm giving it to you. God, I'm relying only on you. Come to my rescue. Come to my rescue. Heal me, God, or give me your strength, because I have none to endure through this difficult time. He'll come to your rescue if you pray something like that. One more thing Paul tells him is important. <laughs> he said, you guys are helping us through this dark season, this difficult circumstance by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has gracious, graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. This is instructive to those of us that have friends or family members that are depressed. He said they helped him when he had those depressive symptoms by praying for him. Family, friends of those that are depressed, would you just start praying? Quit judging, quit criticizing, quit making light of it. Just start praying. God, I pray that you'd heal them. Or if that's not your will, that you'd give them your strength to endure. God, I pray that you'd help them, give them hope. God, be there for them, be the source of their comfort. Would you pray for them? That's what we should do. We need to pray for those among us that are suffering and hurting, not just depression, but with anything, going through any difficult circumstance. We should pray. And we should never give up praying. And then we should make ourselves available for God to bring comfort to them through us. And we should encourage them to receive God's comfort for them through other people. Let me talk to you about a, a few other people, I think, that can especially bring comfort to the depressed. Can I talk to you about a few of them? Here's the first one. It's this. A doctor can. Again, I'm assuming in this talk you've been diagnosed from a doctor with depression. I would encourage you to continue seeing your doctor. Don't feel guilty for seeing your doctor. Do you feel guilty for seeing your doctor if you have stomach pain? No. Do you feel guilty for seeing your doctor if you have chest pain? No. Do you feel guilty for seeing your doctor if you've got pain in your hand and your leg? No. Why would you feel guilty for seeing your do doctor about something you think is wrong in your brain? Stigma. We're trying to remove it here. Don't feel guilty. And your doctor may refer you to a psychiatrist. Don't feel guilty going to a medical doctor that can help you with an illness in your brain. Don't feel guilty. I've gone to one before. Tommy Nelson, the guy in the first talk, that big church, large church pastor, he's gone. He recommended some seminary students go if they ever got sick. Don't feel guilty going. And your doctor, your PCP, or your psychiatrist may recommend you take some medication. Don't feel guilty for taking some meds to help you. Do you feel guilty taking meds for any other illness that your doctor treats you with meds for? No. So why do you feel guilty about this one? Well, it's, it's, it's stigma. Do you know how many emails I've gotten? Just after that first talk in the series of people saying, Chris, it set me free. I've been having to take an antidepressant or something because something's going on, and I felt guilty. I'm like, how have we gotten to a point where people feel guilty for something like that? That's crazy. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm going to put it on the screen just so you know I'm not saying this, okay? Because I know I'm going to get some emails, okay? I'm not saying this. I'm not saying everyone needs to take medication. Everybody needs to go see the doctor and take some medication, okay? That is clearly not what I'm saying, okay? <clears throat> Next slide. But if your doctor recommends it 
and you usually trust your doctor's wisdom on treating other illnesses that you have, why not trust him or her on this one? That's what I'm saying. People need to decide with their doctor what is best for them based on the severity of their depression. Chances are if it's mild, your doctor will encourage you to just get therapy, to see a counselor, a psychologist. If it's moderate or severe, uh, potentially they'll say that some medication could help. But you should decide with your doctor, not feel guilty about it. Now, my assumption here is that you have a doctor you trust, okay? And that, you aren't, and that they aren't eager to give out medicine unless you need it. If you're like, well, I'm not even sure about my doctor, they over-medicate, okay? If you have a problem with your doctor, guess what you need? Another doctor, okay? Get a doctor you trust, and if you trust him to treat other illnesses you have, trust him to help you decide with you about the treatment for this one, okay? This is somebody, a doctor, this is somebody that God can use to bring you comfort in your depression. Don't feel guilty. Another person, a second person. <coughs> a Christian counselor or a psychologist. Most doctors would say this is crucial in the treatment of depression. Crucial. A Christian counselor, a psychologist can help you think through negative thought patterns, help you with Romans 5 thinking, like we talked about a few weeks ago. And oftentimes they can work with your doctor to know what the best treatment plan is. A lot of times doctors will want to work with somebody like this because these guys might even know better if, if your depression is mild, moderate, or severe. So look for comfort in a doctor. God can use a doctor to bring you comfort. God can use a Christian counselor or a Christian psychologist to bring you comfort. And third, a pastor. You know, <laughs> what I know about depression is a lot of times when people are depressed, they feel utterly forsaken and rejected by God. They feel unloved. And a pastor, you see one of our pastors, we can assure you that is not the case. And we can remind you and show you scripture after scripture after scripture that shows you how much God loves you even in the darkness that you're going through right now. A pastor can help. God can use a pastor to bring some comfort too. And we can also help you process through what God, what God might be wanting to show you during this time. Perhaps what you're experiencing is spiritual attack because you're taking great risks for Jesus. Maybe we can help you discern if that's true. Perhaps part of the reason you've experienced this, maybe it's the cause, maybe it's worsening it, is because you've been running from God. If you run from the source of comfort and joy and hope, don't be surprised when you get the opposite of those things. You say, so Chris, are you saying that depression can be caused by or worsened by running from God? Absolutely, I'm saying that. Here's the problem that I addressed the first week. Here's the problem. The problem has been that the church has often acted like running from God is the only cause of depression, and that's definitely not true. But there's no question it's the cause of some depression, and there's no question that it can make depression worse, whatever the cause is. Again, you run from that source of joy and hope you, don't be surprised when you get the opposite and you enter into that downward spiral that could lead to a clinical diagnosis of depression. Now I want you to hear from Amanda, one of our worship leaders. She's the worship leader now at our downtown campus. She's led at our other campuses too. And I just appreciate her so much being willing to share her story to help remove the stigma of mental illness in the church. And what you're going to hear in this story is that in her depression, she saw it worsened because she ran from God. And she saw it get better when she ran back. I want you to see her story. Take a look. I've struggled with depression since I was very young, seven years old to be exact. At that age, even though I didn't understand that I was depressed, I can look back now and say that I was. From the age of seven to 21, I struggled with a deep depression that caused destruction in my life and to those around me. Looking back, I can understand now that the enemy wanted to control my mind and destroy my life before it even had a chance to fully begin. I started experimenting with the medication that my brother was taking for ADHD. It would calm my nerves, but also cause terrible withdrawal and depression. At about 15 years old, I began cutting myself and listening to music that talked about ending your life and hating the world. Then, I began to struggle with questions like, why am I alive? 
and when will I die? No one knew of my struggles because I was ashamed to talk about how lonely I felt. I felt that if I shared my feelings, people would try to get me help, and I was too embarrassed to admit that I needed help. In my darkest days, I could clearly hear a voice in my head saying, you don't deserve to be alive. Everything would be much better if you were dead. And deep down, I started to believe it. I tried to overdose on Ritalin and alcohol one night, but I was unsuccessful. And my mom knew that something was wrong with me, but she didn't know how to help. I was very ashamed of my behavior because I knew it wasn't right, but I continued to do it because it was the only escape that I could find. And in college, my inability to deal with my depression became an issue that I couldn't escape. I would drink any time that I felt emotional or overwhelmed. I lived a self-destructive lifestyle that didn't honor God because I felt like I wasn't worthy of His love anyway. One day, while praying, literally on my knees, I felt the nudge from the Lord to get up off of my knees and make a decision to change. The decision to stop finding comfort in my sorrow and recommit my life to Him. So I started attending Church at E-Life, recommitted my life to Christ, and got baptized. And I can honestly say from that day that I never felt the urge to drink for comfort or hurt myself again. I realized that God loved me even in my brokenness. He rescued me from myself, and I would honor Him by treating my body with dignity and respect because it was the body He had given me. God would be my comfort and joy even if I saw days of sorrow. That powerful, would you help me thank her for sharing? <laughs> Amanda found what you would find if you've run from God and it's worsened your depression or you've, you're running from God and it's, you feel like it's sending you into the downward spiral. She found that if she committed, recommitted her life to Christ or you'd find if you commit or recommit your life to Christ, that He's a merciful Father and He's the source of all comfort and hope and joy. She said this was one of her favorite verses during this time as she was returning to the Lord. Psalm 34, verse 5. Those who look to Him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. She initially wouldn't look into Him for help and things just got worse. She started looking to Him again for help. She became radiant with joy. She felt some of the symptoms lift that had come on because she was running from God. Some of you may identify with her story. Maybe you're on the run right now. Would you stop running from your joy, from comfort, from hope? You're running from Him. It's a person. His name is Jesus. Don't run from Him. Look to Him for help so that no shadow of shame will darken your face. Like a man to recommit your life to Christ if you've already committed your life to Him or commit your life to Christ for the first time if you have not. By simply saying, Jesus, here's the thing. I'm a sinful man or woman and I know I've been on the run from you and you're a merciful Father and I've run away. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I believe, Jesus, you came and died for these sins that I've committed and you rose from the dead on the third day. And I'm just asking that You'd be my source of comfort and joy, hope. And that you'd forgive all my sin and save me from hell, which is what I deserve. Would you do that for me, Jesus? And if you pray something like that, committing your life to Christ, He'll do it. He'll save you from your sin. He'll forgive you, declare you righteous in His sight, and you'll find that Jesus is Father. Your loving Heavenly Father is a merciful Father. He's the source of all comfort hope and joy. So make sure you don't run from Him and from what you're really after. Run to Him. Even in your darkness, He loves you. Run to Him. He'll have His arms wide open. He'll pick you up. And like a loving, heavenly, like an earthly father, He'll hold you and He'll say, I'm here. I got you. Don't worry about this because He's a perfect, loving, heavenly father. 
As I close, I just want to read these verses again, but without commentary, just so you can see how powerful they are in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is a great hope. Let me remind you of it one more time. Paul said, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and we've learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. And church, what I'm wanting you to know today is if you don't rely on yourself and you rely only on him, he will continue to rescue you as well. That's a great hope. That's a great hope. Next weekend, we're going to finish the series by talking about suicidal thoughts. What do you do if you have those? We're going to talk about it. And then I want to speak to a group real quick before I pray that may be here and you've never told anybody that you are battling, you feel like some type of depression. Maybe you've had suicidal thoughts. Maybe you have a plan. We've been saying throughout this series about wearing these bands, there's no stigma here. We want to help you. Would you let us? These bands have said, my band is wearing off, okay? So it doesn't say much anymore, but it did say, hashtag not alone. And it's our way of saying we don't stigmatize you and we want to help you. Would you go to a pastor in the back, either during the worship center at the end of the service, and tell them, hey, I'm struggling. I'm having these thoughts, or I think I'm depressed. And we can refer you to a doctor, to a counselor. We can meet with you and tell you how much God loves you and pray with you. I mean, we want to help and help you have hope. But you got to reach out for it. We, please let us know. And, be no judgment, just comfort, please. You got these cards in your chair. This is a suicide prevention lifeline. If you're ever just sitting alone and you've had some thoughts, call this number and somebody will talk with you. For additional resources, you can go to our website. It has a list of counselors that we recommend in the community and some other resources there as well. So just wanted you to have that. Remember what Paul said at the end of 2 Corinthians? How did the Corinthians help him during his difficult time? By praying for him. So let's end today at all of our campuses by praying for those among us that are battling depression. I'm not gonna ask you to do anything if you are, but if you're sitting next to somebody, a family member or a friend, you know that that's what they're going through right now. Just grab their hand or put your hand around them or something as we pray, just so that they know, hey, we're here for you. You're not alone. We're gonna help you through this. God, thank you. that you're the source of comfort and joy and hope. And God, there's some people here listening to me now. They are depressed, clinically speaking. And um, they want help and hope. And so God, I pray that you'd allow us to be there for them. To be conduits of your comfort. To help them get with a doctor if they need one, or a counselor, or a pastor. But just to be there to comfort and not judge. God, help them know they have a church, thousands of people that want to be there for them, that care, that don't stigmatize them. God, we pray for your healing. If that's your will, they just be healed. That'd be amazing. But God, whatever you decide to do, we know you're going to rescue them, and we pray that your strength in them would help them in their battle with depression. If for a season still you're going to have them go through this, God, give them your strength because they don't have any. Give them your strength to battle through it, to endure, to be radiant with joy even in a deep, dark time. God, we know you can do it, and I pray that you'd help them to not rely on themselves, but on God who raises the dead. Because we know if you can raise the dead, you can help them and bring them hope and be the source of their comfort. So God, we love these people among us that are struggling with this. And God, we just pray that you'd help them know we care, and we're going to be there during this difficult time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.